go. Hi everyone, greetings, Karen Jacobson here. I'm the uh, director of the Refugees in Towns project. And this is um, day two of our, it's our arts festival today. And I'm delighted to, to be talking to and introducing my, my good friend and, and, well, he's not really my colleague, but he's my very good friend, uh, Tom Cartwright, who's a painter in South Africa. And we're gonna to talk to Tom today about a little bit about his life and how he came to this exhibition, which he has for us. The exhibition is called Feels Like Home. So let's just get started and bring up Tom Cartwright. Um, where are you, Tom? Here you are. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see you. Tom is in Cape Town, my home city, where I was born and which is my favorite place or one of them in the world. And there Tom is. Tom's lived there for 30 years. He's originally from Canada and now uh, is a Cape Townian, painter in Cape Town. Um, <clears throat> and he's done these wonderful paintings which we're gonna see more of in a little bit. But Tom, I, I wonder if you can start us off by telling us a bit about this exhibition called Feels Like Home how you came to that exhibition and how you came to do the, re the, the writ painting, the refugee in towns paintings, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. So sure. we're going to be showing some of these paintings as we go. But um, Tom, do you want to tell us a bit about that? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm also just going to start by thanking you for inviting me to take part in this in the first place and thank all your star, your support people who were awesome and you shifted everything to online and thank you for all of that. And yes, and thank you to everyone really. Um, in terms of Feels Like Home, this is actually the second iteration or the second, this, yeah, the second iteration of a Feels Like Home exhibition. The first one I did in, um, I think it was 2018. Um, and that was actually because I was going back to Toronto to see my family there and um, I'm sorry the sun is just going down behind the mountain so it's still um, and so I was going to Toronto and I thought well if I'm going to Toronto I maybe I should do some paintings and I thought well I could do paintings about home because Cape Town's a home to me and Toronto was a home to me um, and those are the two sort of special places in my life and so I was able to set an exhibition up and that was the first time and for that one I just wrote to people like me who live in not in the place they were born um, and I asked them to send me photos of what felt like home to them and then I selected some of those and and painted those and then while I was working on them I thought oh you know I could really work with this their stories. So I wrote to them and asked them if they would just send me a little bit of a text about the images that I'd chosen. Um, and so that basically sort of set up the format. Um, and then I did that exhibition and that was lovely. Um, I enjoyed it immensely. Um, met, yeah, had a good time with that. And then you, um, you, you invited me to take part in this festival. And I said, oh, hell yes, because I've been wanting to do a version of Feels Like Home that is more about, like, so the first one was more sort of about uh, migration for love or adventure or uh, more just that's where people ended up. Um, and um, my wife actually pointed out that this is a great theme, particularly in the time of the Donald to be writing, ma making paintings and investigating the theme of home um, in terms of immigration and refugee statuses and so on. And, and at that time, it was just when Trump had been elected and was starting to shut down um, ways of entering the US. Um, and so when you asked if I would um, be interested in taking part, I was very keen because it was, well, that's the perfect opportunity for doing that, uh, working that angle of the, the same theme. Um, and so that is how that came to be. Um, yeah, 
and then I, I think Charles, uh, Charles uh, set me up with a number or sort of directed me to the, the, the different um, projects that, yes. that some of your researchers had, had reported on. And so I looked through those and approached some of the people that had, 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 had sort of, I don't know, drawn, drawn those reports up. Some of them looked sort of pretty good for, for narratives. Um, and so I wrote to them and asked them if they would send me images of what felt like home. So it was the same idea. Um, I got some great images. And again, I asked them to send me some text. Um, and I think it's the, it's the relationship between the images and the text, I think, is what, uh, what it isn't necessarily what makes it, but it's, I think it's a critical point of, of the, uh, of this of, of the project and, and maybe why it works fantastic tom that's great so um we're going to be we have all, almost all of the people that you who whose images you used with us today and we're going to talk to them in a minute um, and also look at the the paintings you made from those images but before we do um what the, it's important, I think, to, that we talk about a sort of major event, to say the least, <laughs> that happened in your life. Just before COVID struck, the, the pandemic struck, Cape Town and all of us, of course, in March this year, you were diagnosed with cancer in your leg. And so you spent the COVID lockdown time undergoing radiation and chemotherapy and dealing with cancer. And then you came through <laughs> and then you started working again on the painting. So I'd love it if you could talk to us a little bit about what it, what it meant that you went through this incredible experience and, and what it meant for you personally and your paintings. Sure. Um, um, yes, that, that happened, um, which was a bit of a shocker. Um, um but it was i mean it was an incredibly valuable experience is the the, the short end i was speaking to a, a friend of mine earlier today who had also has had, had cancer twice actually even though he's younger than me um and i phoned him when i got my diagnosis um because i thought he could probably help me figure out ways to 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 get through it um particularly on the emotional side um, and he said, yeah, sort of what we've got, the sort of what we, what, what we gained is that we um, had really had to contend with our mortality. We confronted our own deaths. So I think yeah, presumably anyone with any form of terminal or life-threatening disease, um, the, the opportunity is that you you confront your own mortality like literally i mean i've always tried to live my life sort of day by day and live in the moment and appreciate all the nowness of it but um i think yeah <laughs> there's only so much kind of theoretical as it were um, living in the moment you can do because there's nothing quite like a rush with death to really <laughs> to really put you in the here and now. So I think, I'll, I mean, really, like to, the simplest version is that's what happened. Like, wow, okay, I could genuinely die. Because I mean, there was a while there where we didn't, we knew the cancer was in my leg, but we didn't know what kind of cancer it was. And that was definitely the most intense week of my life, waiting for the results of the biopsy to, uh, to find out actually <laughs> what sort of cancer it was. Um, and it wasn't a super bad kind of cancer, so that was a great relief, obviously. Um, but in that week, I certainly, like, uh, yes, I, I, you know, like, who do I want to be? Who am I? What choices have I made? Who do I want to be going forward? If I've only got three months to live, what are the most important things to me? <laughs> they were pretty, pretty, pretty intense questions. Um, that I felt like I genuinely had to answer as opposed to the hypothetical questions. They were actually genuine questions. Um, 
And so going forward, I think, I mean, the biggest insight I had though, after, okay, well then I spent three months in key, doing chemo and that was the first three months of South Africa's lockdown, which was a very intense lockdown. Um, so everyone was staying at home. So that was kind of nice knowing that we were all doing the same thing. Um, but so and uh, chemo, chemo is not awesome. Um, but it did give me a lot of time for introspection because I didn't have a lot of energy. Um, occasionally went to some very dark places. I think that was just part of the chemo and maybe part of the awareness of mortality. I'm not sure, but anyway, the occasional moments of quite dark places, um, which are also useful for, for learning about life and oneself and so on. Um, so, so there was a lot of time for introspection and then in that I had some quite profound thoughts etc but the big thing that I took from it I think is actually there's nothing that I want to change in my life which was pretty awesome <laughs> it was like okay good I'm doing good so far because I'm not filled with regret so that's good um and then what I really what I realized is that there isn't yeah there isn't anything I want to change really I would just like to do more of the things that I do and the things that I enjoy doing um, I would just like to do them with more love, um, be it being with friends or family or making work or actually doing, you know, working on projects with other people, just really put the focus on working with lovely people. Um, and, and, and kind of that simple, really, like, let's just do everything, um, in the tune of love as it were, it's a little bit cheesy, but <laughs> but really it's a beautiful thing. Um and um so really just yeah moving forward just trying to work with lovely people. I think that's basically it. And and not just work, just be with be so be connected to lovely people um for the rest of my days. Um and then how that related to art I actually spent a few weeks. So I finished my treatments about two months ago, and there is no cancer in my body anywhere now. Um, so we're all very happy about that, of course. Um, and so then after that, I thought, let me just chat with a therapist for a little bit, to just because I've had all these profound insights, um, and it would be a real shame if they just wandered off and I got sucked into like the version of me that existed before cancer. I mean, not that that was a terrible person or anything, but I just feel like, my God, I'm so enriched right now. Like, I would really like to integrate all, all my experience and um, sort of everything I learned. So I thought, let me chat with a therapist. So I did that for a few weeks. Um, and I said, when I, when, I, when, I, when I first, and it was all online, um, and I said to him, I'd like, to talk you know, about this cancer experience and maybe a little bit about painting as well, because I, I, I just I would like to talk about painting. Um, and it ended up that I talked about 20% of the time about cancer and 80% of the time about painting. <laughs> um, and, but I did realize eventually why that was, and it was because everything that I want to in integrate into my life in general can actually if I, if, I could, if I could get that to happen in my painting, I could get it to happen in my life. And so that, it, and, and the basics of that was simply living with more freedom, living with more spontaneity, living with less self-doubt, um, and sort of embracing now and trusting myself. Yeah. So that's how that all manifested in in the work so and so i had started the work so yes i had started the, the, the works for the festival in probably january because i think it was originally scheduled for march i probably started in december january i was still work, i was working on them when i got the diagnosis and then covid came so then i wasn't going to be going to uh, boston anyway and then somehow no one was going to be going anywhere um and then after after I'd got the all clear a few weeks after that, um, you guys wrote to me and said we'd like to do it online. I was like, oh, 
to finish the paintings then. Um, but it was quite exciting because now I had like all these insights and I had an, I already had a project sort of underway that I could start trying to channel those insights into. So it was, it was kind of perfect. Well, this is just totally fascinating. And I'm wondering if when you look at the paintings you did before, mm. the BC paintings, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then the, the, yeah, afterlife paintings, I guess. <laughs> um, but do you notice any difference? I mean, or do you feel differently toward them? Or did you do something different to the paintings from the BC time? It was definitely just like how I have lived my life since, I mean, it's only been two or three months, so it's not a heck of a long time, but what it, like the difference that I feel in my life is there's just, there's less of a separation between myself and my life in both painting and in general, there's sort of, there's sort of like a, a layer of, of self doubt or of, of sort of restraint has, has been removed. And I, I sort of feel the, 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 the biggest kind of, basically the, a, a big thing for me now is that I feel like if I'm doing it, it's right. Which is delightfully simple. Um, so it's not, oh, I wonder if I should be doing it this way. It's like, I am doing it this way. Thus, it is the way it should be done. <laughs> <laughs> it's it wonderful to hear. It's so simple. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you're saying this. I think for artists, uh, it's, it's wonderful. But I also think for all of us, it's wonderful that we have less self doubt. Let's yes. just take away the restraint from ourselves. Just let ourselves be. It's wonderful what you're saying. It's a message for us all. Okay. Um, I would love to talk to you more, but I want to get on to, to, to have us talk to our people that you, whose paintings you did. Definitely. And so I'm going to introduce them one by one or, or and maybe, I don't know, we, we've kind of, we're kind of doing this on the fly, people, because we haven't really kind of choreographed this whole thing so perfectly. But I'm just going to call up as the people who Tom's did paintings, whose photos Tom did paintings of, <laughs> and Tom has talked, and they have talked to each other, and so I'm just going to call call on people, and let's start with Barnabas. And I want I want people to introduce themselves a little bit, just say who they are, where they are, um, anything you want to say, but you can't talk too long, people. Okay, <laughs> I want you just to talk for a couple minutes. And Barnabas, are you ready? Are you are you there? Barnabas, while he's coming on, is, I'm just going to say, is in South Africa also a Zimbabwean, a Zimbabwean and he's living in Bloemfontein, in, a, in, in, where are you, Makanda, in... Makanda, yeah. All right, Barnabas, there you are. Take it away. Let's go, Barnabas. Uh-huh. Uh, I am a PhD student and I am currently at Rhodes University in Makanta. Um, it used to be Grahamstown, so the name changed um, in 2018, uh, just a few months after I had arrived here. So um, I lived in Cape Town before coming to Makanda, and to be honest, um, South Africa and Zimbabwe share the border, so uh, there's a lot that really reminds me of home uh, in, this, in this country. Uh, be it the people that I meet, there are a lot of uh, Zimbabwean immigrants living in, in South Africa. So um, every time, be it in Cape Town or even here in Makanda, I meet people who speak my language and then, I mean, um, it's, it's something that always reminds me of home. And I remember I had this uh, interesting conversation with Tom as well uh, during um, the lockdown. And he was asking me if there's something that reminds me of home as well. And um, I was actually telling him like, uh, people are queuing say at the bank or to get into supermarkets and so on. And it's something that is a little bit awkward in the case of South Africa, but when you go to Zimbabwe, this is something that we have been experiencing for years. Like, 
um, 2008, at the height of uh, the hyperinflation and so on, uh, it was even the worst time. You would have people doing for uh, at a supermarket trying to get uh, basic commodities or queuing at a place that they had been informed that probably uh, it would have those basic commodities. And uh, to their surprise, at the end of the day, after spending a whole day in a queue, you find that the, the, the commodities are not even there and you are, you are actually on the queue. And then you would queue at banks uh, to get your uh, salary, uh, to access your salary or something like that. So, yeah, it's something that we've been experiencing quite a lot. Then um, the name of this institution that I'm learning itself, like Rhodes University. Um, remember, my country, Zimbabwe, was actually named after the person who this institution is named after. So... Uh, Rhodes and then Rhodesia, um, there is a connection there. And then uh, you find that uh, um, also there are a lot of jacaranda trees around. This institution is something that we have in almost every mission institution and in town uh, within Zimbabwe. And then uh, the deplorable state of the roads in this town uh, is something else. Um, it, it it also I mean it only parallels what I have experienced at home because if if you look at the uh, the roads that are in Zimbabwe whether they are highways or the roads in town or whatever they are also in a deplorable state with a lot of potholes and um, mm, okay uh, there's also a high street which happens to be maybe the main street within uh, this town. And uh, like I say within that uh, uh, little story that I shared with Tom, it reminds me of uh, Bulawayo, which uh, happens to be the second uh, largest city in Zimbabwe. Bulawayo has got these wide roads where you have uh, maybe uh, parking space within the middle of the road and then parking space at the, uh, at the far right end and then at the far left end as well. And uh, that is the scene uh, within High Street as well. And um, yeah, maybe that's about it. I don't know if there's something that I have to talk about. <laughs> Barnabas, that's great. You're making me feel so <laughs> sad and homesick <laughs> to talk about Jacaranda <laughs> and Wild Street. Okay, so thank you. That was wonderful. Yeah. I'm going to move us to Tash, my, my dear Tash, from, who's also from Zimbabwe. We, we heard Tash last night speak on our suitcase stories, but we're keeping it in the southern, in the subcontinent for now. So Tash, are you ready to speak? Tash is in Zimbabwe now. Tash, are you, are you, are you live, my dear? Hi, Karen. Yep, I'm all ready to go. Great. Um, thanks so much. So um, my name is Natasha and I'm based in, I'm in Harare, Zimbabwe. And um, yeah, I, I loved working with Tom on these, uh, on the pictures. And uh, I suppose my first picture uh, looked at the idea of new beginnings um, and entitled it The Farm because I actually, I moved to Australia with my family and have, so now my story was all about returning home, coming back to Zimbabwe. And um, this picture was a, is a picture of our house in, in Australia, the family home we built there. And I suppose it was my reflections on how home on a personal level is really all about comfort, familiarity, and safety. And um, you know how the need for home is sort of central to our ontological security. Um, and I always sort of never felt at home in Australia, but, but this place does depict it. But the, the Zimbabwean flag, shows that that need to reclaim and, and hold on to our identity of of where we we come from but um i suppose yeah and again in this picture it, it kind of showed that home is given meaning through our social relationships and and they really existed hugely in in australia we managed to to really rebuild those so um do we want to look over all the pictures yeah now shall i talk to other images yeah um and then, yeah, my other one was a trauma teddy, which when I worked with the Red Cross, they used to give them um, as psychosocial support to people who had, had lost their home, mainly through a natural disaster, 
but um, when I was looking for photos for Tom that depicted home for me, um, this was again linked to that idea of ontological security, that sort of sense of, of self and sense of mental well-being, and how what the Red Cross did with the trauma teddies was trying to acknowledge that displacement creates this a need to recreate your psychological well-being and um, you know go against those existential anxieties when you when something awful like that happens and the kindness of a stranger that comes and gives you a, a teddy to comfort you in those kind of times really depicted this idea of home being um, not having to be linked to a physical place but actually um, home being more kind of internal to yourself um, and then my my third one um, was in an airplane, which I feel like I did a lot of in the last few years. Um, and I think that that image really for me just evoked this feeling of nostalgia. And Karen and I have talked about the, this Welsh word, hiraith, I hope I'm not mispronouncing it, but this idea of like, it's a meaning or a longing for one's homeland. Um, but through my work with return migration, it, it came through like the idea that it's, it's a romanticized idea of going back, um, returning home, um, because home, as you remembered, will no, no longer really uh, exist as it was. Uh, you know, the people in the structures often no longer exist, especially when we're looking at displacement due to war or conflict. Um, and yeah, I suppose, this picture just summed up that idea of the pain of leaving and the fact that you might never come back to something that looks the same and how a picture can cap capture it, um, but it may no, no, it'll be in a memory forever. So yeah, that was, that was my three photos and thanks Tom for you know, depicting them so beautifully. Yes, they're beautiful, they're wonderful thanks. photos, uh, photo, wonderful paintings and yeah. Thank you, Tash. That's that's absolutely wonderful to hear you talk that way, and, and I'm so glad you're back in Harare now. Okay, yeah, let us thanks. let us. We're staying on the continent. Oh, the yeah, <laughs> we're staying on the continent now. I'm going to Tash. Are you there, Tash? I talk to oh, you. Yes, I'm here. There you are. All right. Can you yeah. tell us about your your experience a little bit? Where you are? Where you're from? And a bit about the painting. Yeah, so uh, my name is Taj. I'm originally from Darfur region of Sudan. Um, I've lived in, uh, I lived in uh, Israel almost uh, 11 years. And in 2019, I moved to Canada uh, through a sponsorship program. So I'm uh, now in Montreal, uh, Quebec. Um, uh, I was very thrilled actually to hear the whole story that Thomas was talking about. Uh, and the situation that he went through. And I think you are a strong and a, a role model for a lot of people um, to see you like this. Uh, I didn't know that much uh, while we were walking on our photos, but uh, I'm glad to actually uh, you know, be here and hear Holy Story. And I'm happy that you know, the cancer um, the cancer went off. Uh, I have, I have chosen a few photos, and I think uh, among them, two were selected. And uh, one of them was actually just about the nature, uh, generally, you know, like I was born in a village uh, in uh, Western uh, Darfur region. And the area that I was born is like in the middle of mountains with a lot of rivers, and the nature was beautiful. And as a child growing up there uh, before the war of 2003, uh, I had quite a happy childhood, very connected to nature, very uh, uh, lively in terms of, you know, just going to mountains and having um, a natural connection to that nature. And then suddenly the situation turned out to be uh, forcing everyone to run away. And um, as, you know, we run all together. Uh, I end up in Israel, and in Israel, I found um, two very contradicting issues. One was the fact that I actually felt like Israel was, you know, it looks like a home in terms of nature and in terms of um, uh, going to countryside and seeing that. Uh, but at the same time, I had that feeling of, you know, I. I'm just thinking about home. 
I kind of miss home at the same time. So it was very difficult for me because in one hand, I kind of enjoy the feeling of looks like home, but at the same time, I had this feeling of um, uh, missing home due to the fact that I see all these natural views, in, especially in north of uh, Israel. And um, the second future, so, you know, the coffee, we call it Javana, the one that you can see. Um, it is a very common social uh, coffee that, you know, uh, people, especially in Sudan, in Eritrea, in uh, Ethiopia, like East Africa in general, uh, they kind of sit and drink. And uh, in Sudan, it's also very common because uh, mainly it's a social event where, you know, um, in general, women start making it and it has not just, you know, coffee, make coffee, give it to someone, but also, you know, it's like, you know, it has um, snacks that come with it. It has this, uh, it smells, you know, they have all these different perfume that they put around it and music and, you know, sometimes can it start from 12 or 11 after breakfast and it goes all the way until like, you know, eight in the evening. Mm -hmm. And what happened during this time is like, uh, it becomes a social gathering where a lot of uh, very important issues are discussed, like in terms of problems, in terms of uh, uh, psychological support. And when I was in Israel, I realized that actually it became a very, very essential part of our life. Uh, we, have, uh, we had um, a few coffee places where you can just go and meet friends there and put Japan in the middle with, you know, uh, popcorns and snacks also and sometimes we spend three four hours after war uh, it was a lot of help because through the, you know i spent 11 years without any refugee status so i was basically in a two months condition a release visa not recognized as a refugee and that's the you know the the status of all asylum seekers refugees there in israel you know uh, it was a lot of psychological uh difficulties that we went through and you know when you come after a long day and sit with your friends in a coffee place you know and discuss some issues regarding policies regarding uh, our situation in general it was kind of a relief and when you go home you kind of you know find that feeling of relaxed i'm relaxed now and you can sleep get ready for the next day and i kind of associate that to the activities of Jabana, of Bun in Sudan, especially, you know, uh, when it comes to also psychological support. That's why for me, it was very interesting, you know, to see these photos and connect to both home and abroad. Uh, that's what I would say. For me. Thank you, Taj, this is wonderful. I just love this image of the coffee and thinking of you all sitting around drinking coffee together. Right. And it's wonderful, just a wonderful, powerful image and a beautiful painting that goes with it. Thank you. Uh, I hope we have time to, to come back to all of you, but I want to make sure we, we reach everybody. So now we're moving further north across the continent and into the Middle East. And we've got, let's see, Leila and May. And is, is Nuren with us? And okay, let's go, go to Leila. Where are you, Leila? Hello. Um... First of all, I was listening to uh, Tom's story about the, his, his struggle with cancer, and I was surprised. I was so amazed by that, that uh, I, I, I'd like to congratulate you for the strength, for the strength that you had. And then I'd like to, um, it's just, it's, it's, it's so the concept of death, it's um, showed up in my work, in my research, because I worked with different, um, with a difficult group that they come from Syria, right? So they, they came from Syria and then they were in a disastrous situation, socially, individually, politically, in many ways. So um, your struggle, I was trying to connect it, to connect um, your struggle with that confrontation with that to my research, my experience, that, that the photos that I said regarding as, as myself, um, a refugee, and also my research subjects that they are refugee in a you know, very explicit way of you know, being displaced and being refugee. So I was trying to connect it with the concept of social debt 
the physical death and social death. So in, um, I have had many stories of these women that they, for instance, one of them that they kept to just staying with me was that the, a group of family that they were uh, crossing the border when, when they got stuck somewhere at the, some, some place at nowhere, and then they were under attack, they had to take refuge in a house that they, they didn't know what's, what was going on in that house. So they, they, they got into house and then they found 10 dead bodies in the house, but they didn't have a place, they didn't have a choice, so they stayed there for one night. And then one, one when, when I asked that, you know, that woman that, okay, so what happened, what was the most difficult time when, when uh, you crossed the border, she was telling me that, okay, so that night, it was freaking terrible that we were trying to take refuge in that house. They're already full. They were, uh, it was full of dead bodies. So it was very symbolic in some ways and was very terrible, horrible experience. I mean, just literally, literally, you know, the experience that they went through. So and when it comes to my own experience and then the photos that I sent, it was very interesting that, um, so for me, or uh, in some ways, my research subjects, the concept of social death, it's, it's very important. It, it just it got my attention that how the you know, refugees and displaced people, when they cross the border, they just they come at some point you know, in the early years of their living in the new country, they, they struggle with um, being uproot, being uprooted, right? So they have to begin reconstruct and rebuild everything from zero. And so that, and also try to be active, meaningful, meaningfully, and try to be, you know, to live their life existence in a vibrant way in a society. So they try to connect with their individual life, going through all this terrible situation, and then coming, coming to just connect themselves with what's going on in the whole, the whole country. That in that phase, even either it just you say it, it's short or it's long for somebody, for some people it's difficult, for longer for some, but some, people, some groups that are shorter, that kind of social death, I guess, happens. I don't want to be so dark. <laughs> But still, I think that it's very important in terms of the connection. And then you show this, this photo about these white balloons that I sent to you. There are some people here standing that are because they were protesters. And we, I saved it. I don't know why I saved it. I saved it in my photos. But it, for me, when I get back to it, it's a meaningful in terms of my social life in Iran. When I was active, when I was, and when I had community, when I was socially and politically very active. So I saved this photo, and then you chose this photo. And so it's very interesting that okay, so you should why did you? <laughs> so I sent some other other photo about fruits, about foods, and so other other things. So um, it just. It's, it's interesting that how we, we can connect. Uh, I, I make sense of the connection between you as a painter and then the image. And then, and then when I got back to my memories and I tried to make sense of it and I wrote that text to you and it's just, oh, okay, so I found something. This one, this photo is really interesting that um, it reminds me, it's, it's a Sufi dance that's very common in Middle East and especially in Iran and then Turkey. So it's a constant movement. It's constant crossing borders. But at the same time, when you, uh, when you stop, it's just, it's a call stop. It's just, you are on the floor, your foot on the floor, but at the same time, you move all the time. That also is very interesting that you choose it. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> You're, you're mute. You're from Iran. You didn't mention that you're from Iran, but you work with yes. Syrian refugees. Yes. And yes. You're, you're in, did, tell us where you are now. I am in Michigan. I am in Detroit. I worked, uh, uh, worked with uh, Syrian women 
And so they, at some point, I see very similarities between my situation as a refugee and their situation as a refugee and the destiny and the, you know, the, all this political atmosphere, that political things that are going on between Iran and Syria. I just feel amazing in terms of the similarities between me as a researcher and there at them. Yeah. Thank you so much, Leila. That was wonderful. Um, let's see. We we want to not. We want to make sure we get everyone. Is 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 May here? May, May here? May there you are. Yes, May. Please Hi. Where about you and where you where you're from and where you are and all that good stuff. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm a little emotional after Leila's. <laughs> it's not you, Leila. Don't worry. Just. Uh, thinking about actually just the idea of home. Um, so my name is Maim Zayik. Um, I am originally from Aleppo, Syria, from Halab. Uh, but I actually migrated to the US in 2000 when I was 10 years old. Um, I'm an immigrant, uh, even though when we left, it was under, you know, I mean, in our country, at least in Syria, my dad was not on good terms with the government. Family still isn't. Um, but that was kind of the only way we were privileged enough to have my dad, you know, as a doctor. So we were able to come to the U.S. Um, so just the background of me is, yeah, I was 10 years old when I moved to um, the U.S. I lived in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, that's in the South. Uh, so New Orleans, Louisiana for nine years. And then I moved to Memphis, Tennessee for five years. And now I'm in San Antonio, Texas. So I've been in this southern part of the United States uh, for a very long time um, and I'm what I guess Arabs would call Americanized and what Americans say not you know outsider or not American enough um, but uh, so my idea of home this was funny because um, hi Tom also thank you so, so much it's finally great to see you um, I gave Tom such a hard time this project, it's funny because, you know, I, and I'm very happy to hear that people like, you know, were connecting with it and, and getting excited over it. I think for me, I was excited about it initially, but essentially I just wasn't really responsive. Um, uh, I have that kind of identity of, I don't know who I am, so I don't know what my home is. And so I think Tom had to really, really get to share his personal things with me, which was really great. Uh, making me feel more human, uh, where I was able to open up and send him some photos of what I think my home is. Um, and so, oh, this one is, this is wonderful. So um, in terms of ruins, right, in terms of um, feeling like you're in ruins, but also um, remembering being in that place, that place that's so ancient, that's so old, that's still standing, I think that image right away showed me home, but in the sense of resilience of that landscape around me. Um, and that's me and I'm glad that <laughs> my face isn't in it, but what I love about this is that it just shows that even people have been through this, people have been through these places and um, it's so old that it's still there, even when you can't even see those faces anymore. And so my idea of home definitely is rooted in these ancient and these old places and these um, families and history and things like that. And so, um, so that's one image that I, I think was very easy for me to talk about in terms of home and feeling like that. Um, another one that, uh, that I get very emotional about is um, in my grandmother's home, uh, sitting on her lap. Um, she, uh, don't mind me getting um, emotional. This is uh, really, I think that's the beauty of art um, and beauty of, 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 of what's going on here in this festival. Um, but being in my grandmother's lap, um, someone who I didn't see after I left Syria as a young child, um, is, is a memory that I see all the time, or I have dreams about it a lot. And so that's definitely something that was like, oh, that reminded me of home. Um, you know, so seeing my grandmother's place and, and being there in her lap, um, and never getting the chance to say goodbye, but at the same time, um, I'm so happy that it's in this artwork. And so that's definitely one image that I love. And then that last one that we have um, is, this is our backyard, or I guess our yard um, in Syria in Aleppo. Um, that's me and my sister sitting on my mom's lap <laughs> again. Um, but this is what's special about this is our yard. Um, it's the sense of place, of space, of the 
of everything around it that I never really thought of. The, um, the tree that's behind me um, is, is a very powerful tree to me. Uh, I just, for some reason, we just did so much under that tree as kids and as family, but I never like really looked at it or I just don't remember it very much sometimes. And so in, in this image, what's so beautiful about it is that it definitely, it shows my emotions. You know, when I remember these places, now I actually see the tree, I see our shoes, I see things that I never noticed before. And so I love the, the, the way that this, this exudes that feeling because it's hard to explain to people, you know, when they say, what, where are you from? Or what's your home? Or where you, you know, where are you from from? When I tell them, oh, I'm from Louisiana or Texas or wherever I'm living. It's like, do I wanna, un, you know, release all of this on you, all of this emotion? Because it's very complicated and I still don't really know. But to me right now, I think, with this project, it's, it's got me reflecting on um, this idea and, and knowing that there's still um, perseverance and then there's um, a lot of uh, strength in, in us. And so I love that. And I'm really glad to see that because I am going through a lot learning about my, relearning my identity. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, providing the space to see it in this beautiful work that Tom has did and it's such a wonderful person. Um, so sorry I gave you such a hard time, but I really had a hard time with it too. So thank you. May, thank you. We're, I, a lot of us are in tears ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tom, you, it's your fault, Tom. <laughs> Where are you? Get back here, Tom. You're going to tell us about the rest of, 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 of the other paintings that were not, are not here. Um, people who you painted who aren't here, Akram and yeah. um, Nuri, I guess. Um, where are you, Tom? I'm not seeing you. I'm here, I'm here, I'm okay. here. Okay, so please tell us, and, and thank you for making us all feel extremely <laughs> today. I think the research has had an awful lot to do with that, because as I said, the, the images and the, and, and the texts together are, are a hell of a combo. Um, yeah, so it's great to have the stories that go with the images as well. So thank you to all the researchers for sharing their stories too. Um, the other um, the, the, the other two um, researchers who are not part of this discussion, um, but who did send images are Akram, um, who sent a number of images in um, and he he's from Homs, which he told me he described as I think he called words to the effect of the most bombed place in the world. Um, and he sent me a number of images, um, some that he took, some just from from media. Um, so this is the the first one is obviously just dancers in rubble. Um, and this is more rubble um because that's unfortunately obviously um a lot of what has happened to homes that image was the last night that um akram was in homes before he left he was just, yeah that was the last night in homes so he was he felt that was quite a special image to him and this one this <laughs> i love this image because it's very strange um that's pretty much it's it had a lot to do with why i chose it um and he was having a, a skype call with his niece um and the, the image in the background is is i think actually just a coat hanging on a peg but it does rather loom like the specter of death um, which i quite enjoy for its incongruity <laughs> uh, and the other person who uh, participated was Noor um who actually didn't have any images because when she left home she had to leave with her travel document and nothing else so she couldn't take anything with her so she had no camera no phone no hard drive no nothing um so when she sent images of home to me she sent um just she she looked for images on the internet of 
of places that that felt like home to her that reminded her of home i mean one so this is the the, the train station in izmir um which is quite a, a sort of central point for for refugees um passing through which i just I found two images so basically she sent me some images and then i did further uh, searches uh, on the web to find more images on the same theme um, so those these two are of izmir station in turkey um yeah and yeah so she it was amazing that she left with nothing um and this in fact so this is king hussein mosque um which i don't think she had been to but she said there was a poster or an, a, a photograph of it on her wall at home and so this was it was just the the idea of that place that felt like home to her more than the place itself which is quite cool and this is a shopping area the souk the alhamadja souk souk is a, a shopping area um, but it's amazing because those are in, in the background are Rome, Roman ruins. So it's just, just a big commercial area and literally a Roman archway and ruins of, of another great civilization in the background. So those are those, those ones. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Tom. And um, we, I, I wonder if people have any questions that they'd like to ask you or any of the, the researchers, just to, just to, in case people aren't clear, that, so all of the researchers that we are talking to here have written case studies or case reports about their towns that they live in now. And so those towns and more about their experience and those reports are up on our website, on the RIT website. <clears throat> So you can read more about people's experience there. Um, and of course, Tom's paintings are also on the, on the website and on his own website. Um, so yeah. But if we have any questions, I'm sure Tom would be happy to take some questions from people. I believe Mindy Nirenberg has a question or a comment. OK. Sorry, I missed the name, Kelsey. Mindy, Mindy, yes, yes please, Mindy, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, hi. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for this and thank you to all the participants and for Tom. I, I first want to say that I appreciate your aesthetic and your talent in the formal way that you have transferred these photos into something that's so much more than the images must have been themselves, they have a haunting quality to them. Um, and I could talk a lot about that piece of it for me as, um, as works of art. But I also so appreciate each individual telling their story and the different ways that each, each has told them. And I'm wondering if people are familiar with, it's um, a Korean, South Korean artist, Doho Sa, who has done a series of works on this idea of coming from Korea to different places in the United States and what home is meant. And the first work, which I think just relates to a, a people's stories, was when he first came, he had this idea of that you bring your home with you no matter where you go. And he created a life-size home of his, his mother's home that he had grew up in made out of silk and sewn together and it hung from the ceiling and it was a ghost home. And after that, he then created a home within a home. So he put that Korean home within his apartment building in Providence, all made of silk and you could walk through it. And one of the things that um, I think I recall that he said was that you carry your home, but you can never go home to your home. Like it'll be different if you go back to it. And I think it was um, Tosh who, who moved uh, first from Zimbabwe to Australia and then back again. And so um, I think this question is, is for her of, um, did she feel when she came back that it was the same home that she had left or different? Or how did she feel about that leaving and coming back again? 
Mindy, thank you so much for your question. And I want to push it to Tash now. But Mindy, if you could uh, um, write down the name of the Korean artist. Yeah. We would love to see, to see some of that. I'll artwork. share that with you, sure. Yes, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Ash, did you want to say anything to, to Mindy? Do you have anything to, anything to say? Or Tom, perhaps, anybody, or any of our people? Want to respond to Mindy? Uh, thanks, thanks, Mindy. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely, thanks. That was a great question, because it's something that I found so interesting and in, in why I, I, I looked into return migration initially as, as sort of as a solution to the refugee crisis and looking in the future like how can we help people when they're ready or able to return home and i think that that's it sums it up perfectly because it really it, it's not as simple as just returning home um because i didn't i've had to move to a different city i never lived in harare so it, it was like coming to a completely new place and i actually i've lived in a couple of different countries through my work and I, I think coming back home has been the hardest adjustment of all of them and I lived in Tokyo Japan you know so language barrier you know being illiterate to a completely new alphabet I found it the most hard coming back to Zimbabwe um, and that's largely because so many people were displaced and moved the social structures were completely different um, you know things that you weren't as familiar as you thought they would be um, so yes, it, it, it definitely, but then that essence of you take home with you all of a sudden, only through going through this return experience myself, did I realize how I had found home in Japan. I had found home in Vanuatu. I had found home in Australia. I just didn't realize it at the time because my heart was too busy pining for Zimbabwe. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. That's wonder just wonderful, really. This is such an amazing panel. I can't believe it. I'm just, does anybody else have any questions or comments or things they'd I, like to say? Can I say something? Please. <laughs> I really, Mindy, thank you so much. I really liked your question and, and then your insight um, about the sense of home. You know, when I'm thinking about your question and I'm, uh, I've been, um, working and then writing and then uh, having you know some sort of reflection on in some ways that were, uh, were relevant to your question that about this just a deeper um, making sense of uh, home right with what's home you know as we talked about you know and many many people know that okay so it's not physical construction it's not necessarily a certain way um you know neighborhoods or I, I don't know the architecture or something like that it just the sense of home for me as i got got it from my experience and also from other other um my research subjects experiences is just is a combination of work of imagination imagination of home the work of dreaming and the work of memory that's that's those are some very essential elements that they are just they we can create home for us either you know for for me it's it's really really important but for instance we had we had i had a photo that i sent to tom and it was it, it's a it's a it's a photo of a very old-fashioned house that is uh, with the sign of say on it i love that photo and I took it in New Mexico and it reminded me of the certain uh, architects in my city, my hometown, which just a muddy and then it's, it's a remote area, like, you know, uh, resisting in, uh, to the sunlight. But, I, and then I found it, some found a similar structure here in New Mexico, which is very interesting. But that sign of say, it just, it was more, it was more, and I was, thinking that, okay, so am I ready to go back to my country if, you know, everything goes easy? And then am I ready to go back? Is my perspective of home and my neighborhood and my parents' home is the same thing like that? I'm, not, I'm still, I'm not sure about that. I'm still, I think that, okay, so um, I am in, in liminal space that I just okay. So if I go back to my country, it's of, of course that none, nothing is the same. Same when I left ten years ago, 
So that's thing, that personal reflection and with, you know, regarding the mini question was, you know, leading me to this way of making sense of home and community as movable, as mobile, as crossing borders all the time, constantly crossing the borders. And it's very interesting that, you know, just we maybe in, in terms of creating literature, adding and contributing to more literature about migration, about refugee life, we need, I, I guess I, I need to think more about the mobile home, mobile community, or at some point that rigid, if we take out that rigid definition of home as just certain elements like structure or architecture or so on. Thank you. Can, can I respond to that quickly? Please, yes. I'm just, please. I'm just so very moved by that and the idea of dreams and memory mm -hmm. being such an important part of home. And I'll just share one more thing about that artist. He intentionally created that home out of silk. So if you can imagine, you know, parachute silk, it folds up and he put it in an old suitcase that he could carry with him. And when it's installed in different places, it's quite literally something that he's bringing with him, but it's a symbol, it's, it's not his home. And so okay. I appreciate for each of you that have been through something that I never have of all that you carry with you in your minds and your hearts. So thank you. Thank you. I, I wonder how many of us here today think of home just in different ways. So, so many of us have migrated, um, are not living where we were born. What do we, I, yeah. Tom, do you have any thoughts on any of this? I'm bringing it back to you or Ta Taj or Barnabas or May, anybody want to climb in or anybody of anyone here who's moved? <laughs> who's migrated. I, um, I could add something also. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes, please, Taj, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So um, it's, it's quite interesting, especially, you know, this idea of home. And um, if you see, like, uh, from the photos, I, I uh, you know, the, like my two photos, uh, I totally agree that, you know, this idea of home, um, it's just, you know, a dream. It's just the memory, you know, the things that, um, uh, uh, what's her name, just mentioned. And for me, because, you know, like I left my home country and my village that I was born doesn't exist today. It's, it was completely destroyed by the end of 2004. And uh, everybody is in IDP camp or refugee camp since then, you know, it has been almost 18 years. And today, I still have that connection to home as I was a child. You know, looking at the nature, I still feel, oh my goodness, you know, my village, my childhood, my life there. I still see the, you know, the gathering, the support that comes from the community while they're having coffee. And I'm like, oh yeah, you know, this is what we used to be doing in Darfur in, in, in our village. The question here is like, you know, I, I didn't have a chance to see my family since the end of 2004. I haven't had any chance to go back because I was a statusless and uh, I moved only in 2019. And, you know, the situation in Sudan is changing, but I'm still here on, on not the, like I'm not, I don't have the status that will allow me to go back to my country yet. So I'm still, you know, waiting that moment of going back home. but. I, I always ask myself constantly this question, like, is it going to be the same? How am I going to feel when I go back? And sometimes the question comes like, where am I going to go back? The village doesn't exist. The people are not the same people. You know, people are everywhere in the world today from my village. And even my family, they are in three or four different camps. And you know, this struggle of what if I don't feel the same? What if I go there and I, I have, you know, this 
feeling of like, I don't belong here. I'm not part of this, either to the camp that they are in or even to the community that they are around them. And it's a constant struggle. You know, I'm in Montreal, I'm in Canada now, I have permanent residency and I, I don't have the fear of threat that I used to live, you know, while I was in, in, in Darfur or even when I was in Israel. But, but it's still, you know, there is this internal, you know, struggle of, I want to go back to see my family if the opportunity, opportunity comes, of course, but at the same time, how, you know, am I going to answer all those questions that I just asked? And I totally agree that, look, one thing that I know, as soon as you leave your home, whether you are forced to leave or you willingly immigrate to a different place for a long time, the idea of home just becomes a dream, a memory. Seriously, like there is no, like because in one hand, you're not going to feel the same, but in the other hand, even if you spend all your life, wherever you are, you're not going to feel the feeling of home. So there is this, you know, uh, lost hope in the middle of what is my home? And for immigrants, I think in general, especially for, uh, for forced immigration, like immigrants, the idea of home as soon as you are out, it's just a dream after that. Thank you, Taj. It's, we have lots of people talking in the chat. Uh, Tom, I wanted to bring it back to you and then Bijo wants to talk and we've got lots of people, but Tom, can we, do you, do you, you had something you wanted to say? Um, I was just going to talk about the paintings, which uh, May alluded to in terms of the faces. Um, that um, I I didn't paint the faces. I was a bit I was a bit torn. I even spoke to you about it. <laughs> I was like I don't know. I've, I haven't painted the faces. I don't know if I want to paint the faces. I don't think I want to paint the faces. But is that kind of weird? I mean, yes, it's weird. But is it too weird? No, I don't think it is. And um, but actually, but but what May said about them was exactly, it, it turns out, luckily for me, um, was pretty much why I didn't paint the faces because I wanted the image to be about, about, the, um, about the feeling of the image and not about the specifics of the image. Um, so, uh, so it, yeah, it's not, it, it, I mean, even though obviously it's May's story for it to, connect to more people i think if as as people if we look at a picture and there's a person in it i think we tend to project onto it um onto that person um and if there's a face then we want to read their facial expressions um and sort of interpret the image based on what is happening to the person in it or or how the person in the image is feeling about the image or whatever is happening in the image so that is why i i didn't uh, complete the faces, um, which I do actually, which I'm very glad I didn't do because I think they work much better that way. Yeah, I, I think that um, it, your question, your your comment, sort of connects to uh, a comment that Charles made. And Charles, I'm going to draw, ask you to do to to talk. But Charles, can we just ask? I just would like to ask Bejo to talk first, and then Charles come back to your 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 question. Okay. For, for Tom. Bijo, do you want to, am I saying your name correctly? Please. <laughs> yeah, Bijo? It's you, Marcia. Yes. Am I on? Yes. yes, we can hear you now. All right. I'm in Toronto, in Canada. I maybe have no right to speak because I'm not a refugee but I have lived on three continents, have not moved there of my own free will to some degree, mostly in the wake of a man's decision. And I've been looking for home all my life, really. And I can identify with so much of what the speakers here have said and with the loss of home in those paintings 
And I would like to say that what home means for me now is not so much a place to be as a place where I can, without fear, express myself fully. And at the moment that is in singing and in gardening, for example. And I think that the arts have so much to do with finding home in that way, whether it be painting or creating beautiful gardens or singing your heart out with people that you trust in a safe place. So thank you for stirring up a whole lot of emotions and memories in my person today. <laughs> Thank you for that visual. <laughs> it's great. My pleasure. <laughs> um, I just love to hear you all share your, your thoughts and I just want, I am so loving this. Charles, to you. Yeah, I'll just echo, um, I think this is really moving for everybody and, and thank you all. Um, what I, I was struck by May's talk about um, uncovering a sense of, of home through the process. And I wonder if the um, painting participants and, and Tom would be able to speak a little bit were going back and forth. Did you um, uncover or make conscious thoughts about home that you, you hadn't been aware of before? Or did your sense of home change through these um, conversations or after seeing the final product. And, and Tom, I, I wonder if you could speak to what it felt like um, to take the responsibility of having to portray somebody else's sense of home and, and capture a, a subject that um, is obviously really um, moving to someone and, and intimate to, to who they are. Um, what was that? I'm sure it was nervous you got nervous but also enriching and, and whatever so just the process of those conversations and, and how maybe it changed your perceptions over time thanks um i can i can start off um i was definitely filled with trepidation about um painting about yes that's sort of like being given something valuable by um by someone and then being asked asked to look after it basically um um so that for example was was um was one of the, the 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 issues around not completing the faces really or or not not putting the detail into the faces was was that it's like well this is some this is someone's memory i mean this is someone's special person and this is that person themselves and this is their like so in that sense i, I did feel quite conflicted about like, i mean not it's a little dramatic to say do i have the right because it's too it's it's an image but but i did feel a little bit like yeah that's why i felt conflicted about it really was because um because these are other people's images the, these are images that are special to the people that sent them um and yeah I definitely have a um responsibility to myself and and i want to I want to treat their images with respect and and hopefully some integrity and but at the same time, as I said at the beginning, you know, with the, the sort of you know, what's happened to me is that I, I respond. Basically, I trust myself more now. So I think that was a, it was a great opportunity, really, to 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 trust that my sort of feeling, um, my feeling response to the images and whatever decisions I was making was based what was it was correct again like sort of going back to whatever i'm doing is the right thing to be doing um yeah so it's basically a good opportunity to just trust that i was coming from the right place um, but yes i did feel a bit, <laughs> i did feel a little bit of not quite pressure but i was aware that i shouldn't mess this up <laughs> yeah I don't think you messed up. <laughs> Thank you. We like these. Um, we've got lots of comments. People, um, 
feel free to, to wave at me or stick your little chat so I know that you want to say something. It's, I lo uh, love hearing everybody's thoughts or impressions or feeling just um, Connie. I see somebody, my, someone has asked me what is home to me. Um, yeah. Which actually I was thinking as, as, as someone was talking, I was thinking actually, I think that my sense of home, because, um, because I've moved around a lot, or I moved around a lot when I was younger, or they haven't moved around so much in the last couple of decades. Um, but um, I did realize, I think that cancer, the time with cancer, part of also spending time with people I love is really maybe a bit going back to what Taj said. Um, it was just that it's a feeling, home is a feeling. Um, and home can be a feeling that you carry with you and maybe, yeah, I'm feeling a bit emotional right now, so I must be on the right track. Um, uh, home is, it, it, it's, oh yes, that it's, a, it's a feeling that you can carry with you and in, in, in that sense, and, and it's, it's the, the experiences of all the wonderful, beautiful people that you, that you, the experiences that you've had with all the wonderful, beautiful people in your life, that's actually, to me, maybe what makes home and now I'm really just talking as the thoughts are arriving in my head. So this could come out wrong. Um, but in that sense, I'm like exploring home with other people, like the, the researchers, in a sense, creates a sense of home because we're now building a community and all the lovely feelings that are coming out of this right now feed straight into my mushy bits. And that is, and that is basically where my sense of home is. It's like, it's where I feel good. It's where I feel safe. And if I can take that anywhere, then I'm okay. Because then I am taking those people with me, like all the people that have affected my life in a positive way. Yeah, I'm definitely starting to tear up. So I'm definitely on the right track. <laughs> so have you made us all tear up, all of you, with your beautiful stories and comments. Really, I've, I, in a long time since I've been on a panel that I felt so emotional about all of this. We're at the end of our time. It's a good place to end with what you said, Tom. It's a beautiful place to end. I, I thank you all so much, Tom and, and our researchers and our, our team who helped put all this together. And thank you all so much for coming, really. It's been a really, really wonderful panel. Um, and please stay in touch with us. And, and, and yeah, like Tom said, the Refugees in Towns project is a community that we're building, it goes all over the world. We're linked together by all these people. We love to have you be in touch with us, write to us, look at our website and see if you can contribute in any way to, to your experience, to writing a piece for us. We would love that. Um, and I, I just wanna say that you can see Tom's paintings, uh, both on his side and on our side, um, if you wanna see, look at them some more. I hate to end this panel. It's been wonderful, really. It's the one, the night, the one most wonderful panel I've ever had and honored to, to host and facilitate it. And thank you all so much, Tom, especially to you. So goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>